Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled MicroRNA Profiling Using a Rapid and Highly Sensitive qPCR Panel. My name is Vicki, and I will be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, with ample time for a Q&A session with our speaker. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you do require any assistance, please feel free to contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank BioLine, who helped develop the content for this presentation. BioLine is an international company which develops, manufactures, and markets a wide range of specialized bioresearch regions that simplify, accelerate, and improve life sciences research. BioLine regions are used by life scientists to perform assays and research in many fields from medical, biotechnology, and marine biology to food and agriculture technologies, as well as forensic and environmental sciences. Scientists have come to depend on the outstanding quality and reliability of BioLine regions. Our core competencies and principles areas of activity in R&D and manufacturing encompass gene expression analysis, genotyping, next generation sequencing, biomarker analysis, microRNA research, cloning, nucleic acid purification, custom assay development. And now, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's event. Our speaker for today is Simon Baker. Simon Baker gained his PhD in biological sciences from the University of Warwick in 1991. He returned to the UK to the University of Oxford, where he worked in the Department of Biochemistry with Professor Stuart Ferguson, and then in the Department of Engineering with Professor Chris Knoll. It was here he began consultancy in the biotechnology industry, working with what was then a small biotech company in Epsom called ABG. He has since worked with Thermo Fisher, TMO Group, Fortitude, and many others. After several years as a lecturer in microbiology at Birkbeck University of London, and then a senior lecturer in biotechnology at Oxford Brookes University, he joined BioLine as a full-time director of R&D in June 2012. He is now senior director of BioLine's R&D group throughout the world, guiding the company's development in PCR-related technologies, sample preparation, microRNA detection, and next-generation sequencing. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to our speaker. You may begin when ready. Thank you very much for the introduction, Vicky. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, a little about a, a bit about our microRNA qPCR panel, and I'm going to outline some of the technologies that we um, are involved with and how we compare against them. I'm going to talk a little bit about how our knowledge of microRNA uh, technologies have informed our development program and I'm going to talk about how our system works and how our development means that the, um, the assays are sensitive and rapid and why they are suitable for microRNA uh, profiling. I'm then going to look at some of the general pitfalls in microRNA analysis, and I'll finish off with some questions. Now, there are many different ways of examining microRNA if you're going to look at a, a cell and look at all of the microRNAs. And to some extent, which approach you take is going to be dictated by the results you want. So next generation sequencing provides one um, avenue for exploring the diversity of microRNA in a sample, but the throughput time is slow. It requires quite a lot of, mic of total RNA, of which a small proportion will be microRNA, and it has a low dynamic range. It can't, the sensitivity at the moment 
for the analysis of next generation sequencing means that the error is quite high, particularly if there are small numbers of microRNAs in the sample. For most of us, next generation sequencing infrastructure means that our department or our company would have to make a substantial investment in establishing a, uh, an RNA-seq facility that could cope with microRNA. And the material costs per sample are still very high at the moment. The older technology in which microRNA was built up is microRNAs, which have been around for a couple of decades now. And the specialized microRNA microarrays require less total RNA, but again, they suffer from a poor dynamic range. In other words, they're not very good at um, measuring both very low amounts and very high amounts. Now, many departments um, uh, have the infrastructure capable of, of running microRNAs and analyzing them, and the cost is reasonable. But on the whole, the lack of sensitivity and the fact that they can be overloaded as well limits their use, except perhaps for very broad screens where you're trying to look at uh, thousands of species all at once, so an initial screen. qPCR is coming to the fore. It's by far the quickest way of um, looking at microRNAs. A small amount of RNA is required, and the dynamic range is more or less the same as we would expect for a normal qPCR reaction. We can approach single molecule detection, but we can also, in the same experiment, we can um, measure high, higher amounts of microRNA. Nowadays, most labs have a qPCR machine, and this is all that's required. And I'll go through a little bit later about what is actually required to do such a, an experiment, and include, including the analysis. The material cost per sample is moderate, but the richness of the data is quite um, deep. So if we could look at now why, although we've had qPCR for a while, why until the launch of the BioLine kit has it been so difficult to develop an assay that has uh, good results in most cases. The real problem with analyzing microRNA is the small size of the mature microRNA. So these typically are somewhere between 15 and 20 nucleotides long only. So this makes the normal sort of processes that we associate with qPCR difficult to um, to use, and I'll come back to that in a minute when we look at the individual technologies that are available. The other thing is that there's minimal sequence variation between some of the microRNA family members. So they only differ by maybe one or two base pairs. So the discrimination of the assay method has got to be uh, extremely well tuned in order to actually be able to detect different microRNAs in a single sample. And again, the uh, dynamic range of qPCR means that microRNA abundance uh, can, uh, even if it's very low, can still be detected. Now, many of us work in interdisciplinary groups in which one lab is isolating uh, microRNA from one source and another lab is isolating microRNA from another, and we want to compare results. So this means that if we're using some qPCR assays, we have quite different results depending on which sort of machine we're using. There are many different qPCR machines, and some of them give different results. So again, inter-platform compatibility is sometimes an issue. Moreover, the variation in um, between laboratories, if we take a single sample, do a single microRNA isolation, send it to two different laboratories, and then uh, ask them to compare the results using the same um, assay chemistry, we can get very different results. And I'll show you 
how we've addressed these problems a little bit later on. So when Byline and Meraxis, our partners in Singapore, looked at the problems that we might encounter, we first started to look at the existing um, methods for detecting microRNA. By far the most common um, method, which is offered by several companies, is that we take the, the mature microRNA, a poly A tail is added to the microRNA uh, with an enzymatically, and then a poly T um, is hybridized to the uh, poly A tail, and there's a degenerate anchor on one end. And the five prime universal tag is on the other. Is on the other. So after the first strand synthesis by reverse transcription, we end up with a construct which looks somewhat like this, and then a microRNA specific forward primer can be used for a key PCR reaction, overlapping with the very small amount of microRNA specific DNA within the sample, and this can be detected then using uh, a technology like CyberGreen. The disadvantage of this is that the, the actual length of the PCR product, the amplicon, is still very short, so the number of CyberGreen molecules that can bind to the DNA is relatively few, so the signal that you can get from this is relatively low. So there are a number of ways in which this method can fail, that the poly A tail cannot attach properly, that the uh, poly T doesn't hybridize at the junction with the mature microRNA, and that the overall, that the, uh, the amplicon itself after RT-QPCR isn't uh, readily detectable. So overall, this has poor discrimination because there's only one discriminating primer and poor sensitivity. Now, hydrolysis probes in messenger RNA detection normally can uh, confer a greater sensitivity and can um, be very specific as well. However, the short length of the microRNA doesn't help with the uh, normal hydrolysis probe. And the general approach is that the uh, looped reverse transcription primer is used to bind to the mature microRNA. So after cDNA synthesis, then we end up with a stem loop structure, which is composed of RNA and DNA, so that after real-time PCR using a microRNA specific forward primer and a universal reverse primer priming to a, a universal sequence within the um, reverse transcription primer loop, there's just about enough room to squeeze a probe, a hydrolysis probe onto the DNA as well. But for many similar reasons for, as the poly A tail, a tailing method, this means we have low specificity because we've only got one primer which is specific to the microRNA, and we're also going to have um, problems perhaps with the, uh, the actual spatial uh, uh, arrangement of the primers to get all the oligonucleotides on such a short um, piece of, um, a sh a such a short amplicon. Now, the other drawback over the CyberGreen approach is that a new hydrolysis probe has to be designed for each microRNA. So if you were doing an experiment, which would be quite normal with tens of microRNAs, or if you were in the early phases of the experiment and you were doing a uh, screening process where you might have 800 microRNAs, you would have to have 800 hydrolysis probes and this would cause your PI to um, be rather alarmed at the overall cost. Uh, the EPIC technology that Bioline has developed with um, Merexis 
is uh, confers a greater uh, specificity in that there are three stages at which specificity is incurred. So firstly, the mature microRNA, we have a, a specially designed restricted, confirmationally restricted uh, primer which binds to the microRNA. We then have the cDNA synthesis before, but we add more specificity by using a microRNA, microRNA specific forward primer, which is slightly longer than the, um, the, its binding site, as well as a microRNA specific reverse primer. So in the other example I gave, the reverse primer primes to the loop and it's common between microRNAs, but in this case, a, micro, a microRNA specific primer has been designed to the junction between the uh, site of the RT primer and the microRNA. So we have three levels of specificity and we've also lengthened the uh, uh, amplicon considerably, which means that our intercalating dye has enough room to bind, so we have more binding activities per, um, per unit base, as it were, so that we get, this means we also have better sensitivity as well as excellent specificity. So we have a poll question coming up now, and we're looking at poll question one which deals with the technology that you might be using. Thank you, Simon, and that is correct. We do have a poll question for the audience, which will be launching on their screen. And the poll question is, what technology do you use for screening microRNAs? And the answers we have here are microarrays, nanostring, NGS, or qPCR. So if the audience could please get their answers in, and the question is, what technology do you use for screening microRNAs? And I do encourage the audience to get their answers in, as I will be sh closing the poll question shortly. And I will be closing this poll question and sharing the answers with the audience. So 20% of the audience voted for microarrays, 10% voted for nanostrings, and 70% voted for qPCR. And with that, um, I will hand the presentation back to Simon. Thank you, Vicky. So does this, this the, the three layers of specificity, does it actually work well enough to discriminate between single base pair changes uh, that you commonly see between microRNA species? So on the left-hand side of the screen in green and blue, we've got the LET7 family of microRNAs along with uh, MIR98, which commonly um, have uh, um, problems in detection, in particularly discriminating between, for example, LET7B and LET7C. So those only differ by one base pair, that there's a G to A uh, transition at, one, at the five prime end of the microRNA. So what we've done in this experiment is that we've um, used a LET7 detection systems, for example, we've used LET7A and challenged it with the probes and primers for LET7B, C, D, E, F, G, LET71 and MIR98, and then uh, uh, constructed this matrix. So of course we can see that if you have challenged LET7A with LET7A probes and primers in the top left hand corner, we get 100% results, and so would all the other co companies. But you can see from the results here that often, uh, very frequently, there's no cross-reaction that if you try and detect only LET7G, for example, with LET7, LET71 probes and primers, you will get no results. In a very few cases, we get a very, very small amount of cross-reactivity but in comparison to the other uh, technologies, this is greatly improved, and this is a function of the, um, the 
incremental specificity that we're building up during RTQPCR. So this should give you greater confidence that when you're looking at profiling results, that the results that you see from the, your output really do reflect the amounts or the presence or absence of particular microRNAs. So I talked a little bit earlier on about how the uh, increased length of the uh, microRNAs um, amplicons at the end of RTQPCR increase sensitivity. So a very crude way of looking at this is if we have a fixed um, microRNA level and we challenged it with the uh, probes and primer systems from different suppliers and looked at the CT value. So if we, we have a range on the left hand side in the table at the top from the Haas family of uh, microRNAs and there are a range of GC percents uh, showing that there's um, the specificity is not GC dependent, there's no bias. So the EPIC microRNA had low CT values when we had about 10 to the 8 copies of template of around 12. The other suppliers had higher CT values indicating less sensitivity or in some cases, and this is with the poly A tail approach, there was no result at all which for 10 to the 8 copies you would expect to have some sort of result. And you can see at the bottom, I've just shown here the EPIC microRNA qPCR results. The assay efficiency is as you'd expect, that the slope is minus 3.32 or minus 3.33 as you would expect, and that the no template control was coming up very late and we can detect maybe 100 copies reliably, though we have other data with lower copy number detection, but it's very dependent on the system that you're using. So if we look overall at the uh, strengths and weaknesses of a qPCR approach, of the EPIC qPCR approach, and compare it with microarrays, which certainly of the poll shows is the next most commonly used method. So the qPCR array, sensitivity, high accurate, accuracy, very reliable quantitative measurements. Microarrays, well, they're broad in range in single experiments. You can do a broad range of single experiments. So you can look at, you can look at thousands of microRNAs at a time. And it's been perceived that microRNAs are a good way of normalizing lab-to-lab uh, -lab variation. However, they do suffer from low sensitivity. qPCR weaknesses might be held as the reproducibility between labs, but actually what we're looking at the, is the weakness of the assays themselves. So EPIC has overcome this somewhat, and we're just going to look at some results that we've collected here. So what we did is we took um, we designed EPIC assays for 200 common microRNAs that are found associated with a particular cancer and we collected sera from um, patients, a, a panel of patients and we measured them in two independent laboratories. Now the two laboratories were using different qPCR machines. One was using a Biorad CFX uh, machine, the other one was using the LifeTech via 7. Now we, we sourced this externally and what we didn't expect was that one lab would, was going to be slightly later than the other. And of course, you know, if a company asks people to do something, then sometimes the PI says that there are more important things to do, so there was a bit of a delay between the getting the results from the two labs, and in fact the delay was for over a year. 
So for one lab, the measurements were taken a year later. The sera had been stored in the fridge for a year. But if we looked at the correlation coefficient of the results between the two, uh, two labs on the x-axis from December 2012, which was done on the BioRad, and on the y-axis uh, from 2013, which was done on a different platform, you can see that the correlation of the results between the two laboratories was very good. And this was um, reflected not just the one result I've shown you, but across the board. So the again, the design of the assay has made it very specific. I, the design also allows detection in some quite tough biofluids. So carryover, even into columns, is a bit of a problem in some, uh, some experiments. And again, we took, uh, in this case, around about 340 different microRNA uh, assays, and we challenged the serum and urine, RNA extracted from serum and urine, and what I've done here is I've just arranged the microRNAs um, from 1 to 30, and we get one reading, for example, on the, in, on the far left-hand side, we have a reading from microRNA number 1, which is about 14 in blue for the serum, and in it's about 22 for the urine. And I've ordered the... Uh, serum results in increasing CT and you can see that as we'd expect we get readings for most of the microRNAs but we do have a difference in the abundance of the different RNAs in the different biofluids which you would expect as a normal function of biological origin. The important result here is that we can detect um, the microRNA in each case, and if we look on the far right hand side, we have um, microRNAs which are at the limit of detection of our system here, but are uh, in serum, but can be readily detected in urine. So, how did we actually design these primers? Well, I've shown you some of the technical val validation that we've done not only on our synthetic microRNA templates, as many companies do, but we've also validated them all on human RNA with real patient samples. Typically, these assays can be used to detect as few as 100 copies per te uh, of template per reverse transcriptase reaction. Now, of course, the actual number of copies and the relevance of that is going to be very dependent on your preparation method, but at when you actually get to the PCR tube, 100 copies can be reliably detected. Our development was targeted towards a very extensive literature search. So in designing the panels, deciding which microRNA should go in the panels, we looked at approximately 32,000 PubMed microRNA entries, so this was in, in 2014, and we looked at the most commonly occurring um, microRNAs that are found generally in cancer, generally in biofluids, and generally in stem cell research. We followed this up with our validation, and we did extensive in-house research. We did over 2 million qPCR runs using over 2,000 human clinical samples. And from that, we also learned a lot about internal controls. So together with uh, Merexis, we came up with the thermodynamics that uh, um, allowed the, the um, primer design and followed this up with reagent optimization. So at Bioline, we've been using a, a, a a process of reagent optimization called design of experiments, which means that the RT and buffer worked perfectly with the system for which it was designed. And we're fairly sure that when you're buying um, microRNA from some other companies, this is just their ordinary 
RT, their ordinary qPCR solution. But we had to rework our marks to mix to make sure that it worked perfectly for short amplicons, and then this was validated. So overall, our advantages were we don't have universal primers. So each primer set is designed for a single microRNA. So we had the best specificity, and we checked that we've got uh, good amplification characteristics. So we have good discrimination between the very homologous members of the microRNA families, like the example of LET7 I gave. The, the system itself is, is fast and it reduces the time to get the results. And this is, gives a high, allows a high throughput and frees up time to do other work, which it may not play, please you, but that might please your PI. So we're starting from only one picogram of total RNA. Normally, that's enough to, to um, detect the, the, the microarrays within it. And this is particularly important when you're dealing with very valuable samples, biopsy, or whole blood samples, and if you're working in a collaborative team who are trying to build up a picture. <coughs> Excuse me. The, we have a high dynamic range, so we can detect microRNAs over seven logs. So this should mean that you can do use one assay system to detect few microRNAs or high abundant RNAs, microRNAs. And we provide everything in, in the box as well. So there's the RT, the SensiSmart CyberMix, and you can use it more or less straight away without further optimization. So the other technology that um, I haven't mentioned so far is the nanostream technology. And as I said before, this might be useful in early experiments. And we've had a couple of customers who've uh, begun the, um, their quest to find the microRNAs they've interested in, they're interested in by using nanostream, and then have gone on to use our assays. I'm talking mostly about the panels which are available at the moment, but we will be launching the single assays, um, and they'll be available in the next um, three weeks to a month. However, coming back to nanostring, if we look here, what we've got is overlaid data from EPIC qPCR results and the, na the corresponding nanostring results for the same microRNAs. So at for low ex lowly expressed microRNAs, the nanostring technology has the same uh, disadvantages as microRNAs in that lowly expressed microRNAs are not um, detected very well, so you get a very noisy signal. However, we have a robust quantification with uh, the uh, qPCR that was co-developed with Meraxis. Equally, nanostring is quite good at, at high copy number, but we can keep up, uh, the EPIC qPCR panel can keep up with that as well. So although we're equal at the high copy number, the EPIC uh, assay is much better than nanostring for those important low, lowly expressed microRNAs. So our kits that we're offering at the moment are panels of microRNAs. And I, I mentioned earlier that we've done extensive literature research to identify which microRNAs are available. So these are all listed on our website. So if you don't work on cancer or stem cell or you, you don't consider what you're working with a biofluid, the panels do contain a range of microRNAs and they may be useful for your research. So we offer a, a cancer microRNA panel which we've aimed at the research on the dysregulation and function of microRNAs in various cancer so that you could do a profiling, for example, looking at drug response. We, um, we're working with some 
uh, a research team at the University of Oxford who are looking at the drug, uh, drug response in red blood cells. You could also uh, look at the EPIC stem cell microRNA panel to understand the critical roles of microRNAs in induction, maintenance, or differentiation, or even reprogramming of stem cells to look at changes as the stem cells develop. The biofluid microRNA panel includes those microRNAs that are generally found in circulating biofluids. And this is a promising new area of research where liquid biopsy might provide a means of characterizing disease in a non-invasive manner. So I'd like to move to poll question two now about the biological sources of uh, microRNA. And I'll turn you over to Vicky now. Perfect. Thank you for that, Simon. So we do have our second poll question now for the audience. And that poll question is, what is the source of your microRNAs? So if the audience could please select one of the following answers. And the answers we have here are biofluid, biofluids, including exomes, stem cells, solid tissue, cultured cells, or other. So if the audience could please get their answers in, I will be closing the poll shortly. And I will just repeat the question one more time. And the question is, what is the source of your microRNAs? And it seems majority of the audience has voted, so I will be closing this poll and sharing the, audience, uh, sharing the answer with the audience today. So 56% of the audience voted for biofluid, biofluids, including exomes. Then 22% voted for both solid tissue and cultured cells. So I will be passing the presentation back to Simon. Thank you, Vicky. Now, I talked about platform variability, and for the uh, different cancer, uh, for the different sorts of plate, we offer several different formats. Each of uh, when you were providing a, a product that includes the plates with pre-aliquoted um, microRNA as well as all the reagents, then there's quite a diversity of, of um, systems around. Uh, and so we've offered um, variants with both high rocks and low rocks. And those machines that don't use rocks at all the low rocks will be suited, as well as different plate formats. Now, of course, um, there are many different plate formats. And we, at the moment, we're offering these in a 96-well plate format, a standard form factor. Um, generally speaking, these are in the uh, high, uh, low profile or normal profile plates. And the different combinations are shown here. And I would advise you to go to the website where there's a very helpful tool which will help you to choose the right plate based on your machine. But if you do have any problems, then please contact the BioLine Bio Technical Helpline and we'd be happy to talk you through it if your machine isn't listed on the website or in our literature. I'd like to say a little bit more about the um, configuration of the plates. Um, here, generally speaking, there are around about 88 microRNAs arranged on the plate. So on a 96 volt plate, these take up rows 1 to 11. And then in row 12, we have spiking controls and interplate calibrators. Now, the cancer panel includes 352 microRNAs, which are spread over four plates. So the interplate calibrators allow some systems, which are already installed on your qPCR machine, to make plate-to-plate -plate, uh, adjustments to, to ensure that the um, results are consistent. We've also included spike in controls uh, as internal controls to make sure that your results are normalized. 
Now, normalization of microRNA is a controversial topic. It's not quite the same as the normalization that Van der Sompel and others have um, championed with uh, qPCR, where you can use an internal reference gene, or rather many internal reference genes. Using an internal reference microRNA, there hasn't been a stable enough microRNA to find so far, so we have a spike in control which will provide that normalization reference. On the biofluid plate, in the, the box that you can purchase, there are two plates with 176 microRNAs and a similar number on, in, on the stem cell. Each plate is provided in duplicate so that you can uh, begin to make um, some, uh, either you can look at two different conditions and look at alteration in singlicate, or you can have a single condition and have the beginnings of some uh, uh, idea of the variation that you have in your uh, biological variation or technical variation between your isolation methods. So the workflow is quite quick and simple. The cDNA synthesis step takes around about 35 minutes. The uh, qPCR step, including the um, a melt curve step to check that the cybergreen has functioned okay takes around 75 minutes and in comparison to others then the uh, this is much shorter it takes around about two hours from start to finish and particularly coupled with our um, products for isolation of microRNA the isolate 2 range then this is very quick Data analysis can be a problem, but to, in order to uh, speed that up, we've worked on an Excel workbook that you can download from the web, or you can use our online portal for rapid examination of the results. So if we have RNA sample 1 and RNA sample 2, for example, if, if you were looking at uh, cell lines, RNA sample 1 might be the wild type RNA sample 2, might be the cell line treated with a drug. You set up eight RT uh, reverse transcriptase reactions, which you can see along the top, A1, B1, C1, D1, and A2, B2, and so on. At this point, after the cDNA synthesis reaction is complete, which can be done in a normal qPCR, a normal PCR machine, or you can use your qPCR machine, <coughs> Excuse me. you can store the cDNA at minus 20. You could then use uh, the cDNA. Each tube is then loaded into plate A1. Plate, uh, tube B1 is loaded into plate B1. Your RT reaction C1 is lo loaded into plate C1 after you've added the master mix and the other components for the qPCR reaction. And the, as the probes and prime, uh, probes are, uh, sorry, the primers are pre-aliquoted in the plates, then this is just a question then of sealing the plate with your favorite seal and popping it in the qPCR machine and waiting about an hour for the results. You can, once the results come out and you can get your qPCR machine to export it as an Excel web file and then copy and paste into the, um, the Excel workbook, or you can use the analysis software online. And this will give you the plate layout. It will identify the uh, which well is which microRNA. Um, that information is also available um, anyway. Um, it will give you the raw CT results. It will give you a, a variety of um, ways in which you may be able to interpret your data to show which microRNAs are elevated and which are depressed. <coughs> the subject of controls is particularly important with uh, microRNA analysis as we're looking at many different points at which there can be variation. So uh, the spike in RNA, particularly if you're able to add it early on in uh, just after 
um, RNA isolation, then this provides a very good method of tracing any variation and normalizing those out. And you can see from this rather complicated diagram, there are a number of points at which variation can be um, introduced. And I can't emphasize enough that the, the normal approach of using an internal microRNA, which I've seen um, a few times in published studies, is not really viable in this case. And indeed, one of our collaborators, Professor Hen Fong Tu, has published a paper on, on this, demonstrating the efficacy of the spike in RNA approach. So the spike in itself is a non-naturally occurring RNA sequence, which is easy to distinguish from uh, known microRNAs. So just to finish off, I'd just like to give a couple of examples where we've actually used microRNA to show a difference. So here we're looking at the difference in uh, two people between uh, of a similar genetic background, uh, one with breast cancer, one with gastric cancer. So the, at the bottom we have the um, total results using all two, um, the, all 2,000 known microRNAs, of which uh, 800-odd of, of these have been now validated and will shortly be available as single assays. When we looked at the upregulated microRNAs, we, we identified two which were common between ovarian cancer, breast cancer, and gastric cancer, and none were downregulated, and as markers, those that were upregulated, there were 14 upregulated in ovarian cancer, 12 in gastric cancer, and 27 in, for breast cancer. And a few of those were commonly upregulated between those different sorts of cancer. So that we managed to get very quickly uh, a picture of potential biomarkers using this qPCR approach. So. This is all I'd like to say about uh, at the moment, um, and I'd like to thank my, our collaborators, Dr. Lian Zhu and Dr. Rang Zhu from the National University of Singapore, and uh, they're a spin-out company from uh, the NUS, which is called Morexis, and the group within the NUS was led by Professor Heng Fong Tu, and in Bioline in London, in the R&D labs here, Dr. Fa Chang Pi Hin, work with them to uh, produce the, uh, the, to do all the research that I've mentioned earlier on in collaboration with Moraxis. If you'd like to know more, then please feel free to contact me. I'm Simon Baker, and you can contact me on simon.baker at byline.com, or De Dr. Ben Jackson will be um, dealing with your questions soon, and you can contact him on ben.jackson at byline.com. We do have some open positions in our R&D group in London, um, quite different levels, of, uh, and we're looking for scientists with a biological background. If you're interested in working in London for Bioline, then please contact me on, at the same email address. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll now turn it over to questions. Perfect, thank you for that. Simon. And before we do start the Q&A portion, we do have one last poll question for the audience today, which I will be launching on their screens. And the poll question is, what organism slash organisms are you currently studying with your panels or individual microRNA assays? And please, if the audience could select all the answers that do apply, and I will be closing this poll question shortly. And I will just repeat the poll question one more time, and the question is, what organisms or organisms are you currently studying with your panels or individual microRNA assays? And this poll question is coming to a close, and I will share the answers with the audience. So it looks like 70% of the audience voted for human, 20% voted for mouse, another 20% voted for rat, while 10% voted for both plant and other. And with this, I will start off the Q&A portion of the webinar.
And I want to thank Simon for the insightful presentation. And now I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. So Simon, we do have a couple of questions here already. So the first question we have is, in Epic Technology, how do you join microRNA and loop primer? So the um, essentially just add, uh, it's a simple hybridization that's done in the tube. So you would add your sample to a, to a reverse transcription reaction and uh, allow the annealing to occur. So we've done a lot of work on the thermodynamics of the um, anne uh, the annealing to join the make sure that the joining of the the RT uh, primer and the microRNA is as optimized as possible. And that's to do not only with the um, overlap with the microRNA itself, but to some extent with the design of the um, complementary part as well. Great. Thank you for that answer, Simon. And the second question we have is, do you have rat and mouse microRNA panels? So at the moment, uh, we're only offering human microRNA panels. However, um, I, originally I'm a microbiologist, so I, I sort of have to say that, well, humans and, uh, and mice are not very, uh, and rats are not very um, diverse, and there are many microRNAs which are in common. And we're working on the mo at the moment to validate the uh, rodent um, assays, and we hope to have those available sometime in the future. So we will providing, be providing uh, individual assays for rat and mouse, and um, we are considering whether custom panels would be of interest. So I would recommend contacting your local byline rep to discuss this further if you were interested in particular assays. Perfect. And the next question we have here is, I'm new to the field of microRNA, but have realized that not a lot of systems do not include a no RT control. I'm curious about this rationale. Yes, I think this is, uh, in, our pl in some of the plates, we do provide a no RT control. Um, and for me, this is a useful um, experiment that you can run alongside. With the panels, though, we're looking at differences between in expression. So with the panel approach, an, a no RT control would be uh, not so valuable because we're looking at changes. But certainly, I think with if you were ordering individual microRNAs, then a no RT control would be valuable as it would be for all RCQ-PCR experiments. Great, thank you for the answer, Simon. And the next question we have is, how do other stem loop RT primers differ to EPIC stem loop RT primers? So um, I don't want to get too technical, but this it's to do with uh, the design um, many of the other stem loop uh, primers involve uh, modification, which ours do not. Uh, the advantage we confer, as I said in the answer to the other question, is actually looking at the length of the overlap and the design of the short uh, double-stranded um, piece, which confers a thermodynamic advantage for binding. So we like to think about microRNA as being a very two-dimensional thing, particularly when we draw it on the paper. But we have to remember that they are three-dimensional structures. And even sing short lengths of single-stranded uh, uh, single RNA have a 3D structure. So to get excellent complementarity, there is a, a high element of design, which includes those um, bases which are not directly involved with um, watson crick base pairing. Great. Thank you for that answer, Simon. And the next question is, 
which is best, total RNA or purified microRNA? Well, again, I think this very much depends on which system you're looking at. Um, we offer a kit which is very good at uh, isolating pure uh, or, or size selected microRNA. There's uh, uh, the technology of the column is slightly different from the ones that you can buy from many other places, but it selects specifically for uh, RNA below 200 nucleotides. But in the end, you might want to use total RNA to normalize between samples. It's very difficult to measure accurately micro short RNA on its own. And it's often, uh, if you're looking at a method of normalization between samples, you can actually look at total RNA to give an indication of how well your extraction has gone. So my um, uh, slightly uh, Weasley reply is that I would actually look at both. I would isolate the microRNA so that you get uh, good results from your uh, RT-QPCR, but I would also measure total RNA from your samples to make sure that you are getting efficient extraction from your cells. Thank you for that answer, Simon. So that brings us to our next question. And the question is, what is the limit of detection with this assay? So this is quite, again, quite a difficult question because um, that can be expressed in many different ways. So if we're looking at the uh, minimum number of cells, then that, of course, is going to be uh, the minimum number is going to be very dependent on how well you can extract the microRNA. Once you're into a cell-free solution, in our uh, assay, in a 96-well plate, we can detect about 100 copies of the uh, microRNA reliably um, with, with good results that are good for profiling. Um, if you go down further than that, you can still detect them, but uh, in our qPCR panel assay system where you only have one or two replicates, there aren't really enough replicates in there to confirm um, the error in your uh, results. So probably in this system, 100 copies is about the limit. Perfect. So we do have time for one more question, and the question is, does EPIC require pre-amplification with serum microRNA detection? No. So it's as I um, set out uh, in the um, schematic. Uh, your serum may not need pre-amplification, but again, this would depend on the number of copies per microliter of the microRNA that you were looking at. Um, I can't guarantee that your microRNA will be abundant enough to detect. Um, but certainly, I would have thought, uh, if you're looking at uh, a preamp stage, then probably your detection system is not sensitive enough. And I showed that you could use um, our system for the direct detection of microRNAs from from urine, and that was without uh, preamplification. But again, I think um, it might be a good way to uh, it might be best to take this this question offline because this is a, a complex area, particularly with circulating biofluids. Well, thank you very much for those answers. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. But if you do have any further questions, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen, and that is ben.jackson at bioline.com. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up shortly on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speaker, Simon Baker. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.